justice in a very visible way. And there are a number of, of you, and increasing number of you, who are supporting building resilience um, locally, um, investing in women at the local level, etc. But it's, it's small beer in a way, in the scale of funding of philanthropy. What about the other disruptive questions? Um, the uh, divestment from fossil fuel. Um, the, the questions, the awkward questions that you can uh, potentially ask. So I want to try and kind of gather in um, some of the real um, energy that has been in this conference and uh, link it to the fact that we have this overall crisis. Um, it's a crisis that makes all the other issues relevant but somehow needing a leadership that goes beyond. And I want to stretch you. The word stretch was used quite a bit by Amy, and I like it. I want to stretch you. I want to stretch you to take charge in the leadership that you're going to exercise. Um, in um, a book on climate justice that I wrote, wrote, the byline is hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. There are nine stories in the book, and sorry, there are 11 stories in the book, and nine of them involve women. But there are also two good men. And they're all about you know, building resilience in a problem that you haven't mainly contributed to, but have to address. I have a podcast called Mothers of Invention, and the byline is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And, um, and my co-host of the uh, podcast was eight years old. She's also Irish. She was eight years old when I was elected president. She's half respectful during the podcast because she's, she's a very successful comedian now based in New York. And she is very funny and her humor is very kindly as well. It's very, um, uh, very witty in, in every sense. And she would never explain, but I do like to explain that uh, man-made is generic. It includes all of us. And a feminist solution definitely includes men, and the more men, the better. And I'm glad to see uh, a number of supportive men here um, at this um, conference. Um, you have a lot of power to give that leadership that we need by being disruptive. There are so many ways in which we can be disruptive of the business as usual, and we have to be, because we're not beginning to bend that curve yet, and we're running out of time. It's the disruption of litigation. It's the disruption of divestment. It's the disruption of um, the young people, the strike, school striking, the um, Extinction Rebellion. It's shareholders of companies asking the right questions. It's Mark Carney of the Bank of England warning investors to look at the way in which um, corporations may be invested in fossil fuel or banks may be invested in fossil fuel and that that's not necessarily a good future because they would become stranded assets. The first time I heard that word, stranded assets, I, I kind of was a little bit puzzled. And then somebody said, think asbestos. Think asbestos, too dangerous to employ. Well, fossil fuel is harming our world. And coal <coughs> is the fossil fuel we should get out of quickest. And we need disruption um, to be able to do that. So let me end with an old feminist slogan that the um, personal is the political, and the political is the personal. Um, the personal motivations, maybe, or personal story. I'm fortunate enough to be a grandmother with six grandchildren. Um, I commend my three children that they have produced boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, um, <laughs> aged, from, aged from 15 to two. So I've actually said, I'm so satisfied now. We don't need any more in this part of the world or Ireland. You know, um, uh, just stop there. And I think they're stopping there anyway. Um, uh, but I think a lot, and have from the, very, from the first birth of my first gra um, grandchild, Rory, which I wrote about a book in, at the start of my book on climate justice, um, I've thought about their world. They'll be in their 30s and 40s. Rory, the eldest, who's 15 now, will be 47. The little two-year-old will all be in her, in her 30s. Um, they'll have their whole, half, more than half their lives to lead. They'll share the world with about nine and a half billion people, the UN tells us. It's about 7.8 billion now to nine and a half billion in 2050. And we know there's already water stress and other stresses. So we have a huge issue and problem and we need to assert 
a woman's problem-solving problem leadership. Problem-solving, because we have a big problem to solve, and we need to change behavior. We need to change the way we have run our economy. We need to get away from, we need circular economy. We need to have slow food, slow fashion, all kinds of different behavioral um, ideas. And let me end with something that I feel is the most important, and that is that we are inspired by hope that we do have this good future for our children and grandchildren. And I learned from the then chair of the elders, I more recently, after the sad death of Kofi Annan, became chair of this group of elders that Nelson Mandela has brought together. And we have climate as one of our real um, priorities for re the right reason, but we also very much want to bring hope. And I remember being on a, um, a panel with Archbishop Tutu oh, about seven or eight years ago now in New York. Um, it was a social good conference organized by the UN Foundation. And it was, the room was full of young people who were meant to be on there 